So hear me out. Is Let's Play the greatest comic ever or a terrible story period? That's what I aim to find out once and for all in my review of the popular and controversial former hit webtoon series Let's Play by Mongi, also known as Leanne M. Kresik. Will I find the story sexy and romantic like I did when I first read the series? Or are the critical naysayers correct in that the story is controversial, Charles is problematic, Sam is being manipulated, and that there is way too much sexual explicit imagery going on for a tween comic? We're about to find out all that and more in this video. Welcome to Day Day Does, a channel where I draw and talk about fandom slash storytelling things, such as anime, mangas, webcomics, movies, TV shows, and even books. You know, nerd stuff. This video review has been a long time coming and finally it is done. It feels like I've climbed a mountain with this one. Like I got sick guys and my voice still isn't what it needs to be and I keep having these coughs, which aren't the worst, but they're very inconvenient. I really appreciate everyone coming together to see whether my critical analysis of Let's Play in this video has any merit. I do thrive on discussions and making a once and for all video to explore everyone's points has me hooked. Also, let me preface this video by saying that this review is based off my opinion on my interpretation of the comic. My opinion, however negative or positive, should not prevent you sparkling individuals from reading the story and enjoying it or not enjoying it. My video does not give anyone permission to bash me personally and leave hateful comments that are out of pocket. You and I can disagree on opinions until the earth falls apart, but being saying something you disagree with does not mean I'm insulting the creator as a person or the consumer, you in this case, personally. So don't take my words as fighting words because they're not, but they can be should they need to be. Imagine threatening someone's life over a fictional romance comedy webcomic on the internet. Like I can't even. Alrighty, let's continue. But first a word from our sponsor, Day Day Does, AKA, Yours truly. So I made a website, y'all. This is my official one-stop shop where I can post my web comics. Here's an example of them. You can read them for free and leave comments. My fan fictions, I'm slowly transferring them over. We'll post updates on my writing Patreon first for three weeks before I post them here, fanfiction.net and AO3. As you can read, this website is still under construction. I will post the latest news on any projects that I'm working on here on my website. Once it becomes available, feel free to explore and leave suggestions even. And that's pretty much all for now. Back to the video. Now, as much as I enjoyed the series during its runtime on Webtoon, I was not oblivious to the growing number of people who hated the story or did not care for Charles or whatever else that just didn't float their boat. I did think that the unnecessary hate was kind of dumb, not gonna lie. And even though I read the comments, I just didn't understand where half the complaints were coming from. The other half I did understand because the story is not perfect and it definitely has its flaws that could be improved upon, but some of the hate the series was getting was so wild. So here's how this review video is going to go down. Expectations. I'm going to start with my expectations of what I thought Let's Play was going to be about based on the summary, the thumbnail, series banner, and first three chapters. This is going to remind me the general audience impression versus what we actually got. If you have a different opinion, please let me know in the comments. I will be checking it out because this fascinates me as a wannabe researcher. First three chapters. I think one of the good metrics Webtoon came up with was the litmus test of the first three chapters. Depending on how you execute it, it can really make or break one's webcomic. As a result, I'll be giving you my running commentary as we read the first three chapters together. Yeah, you heard me. We're doing this live, or as live as we can be with a pre-recorded video. I'm only doing the first three chapters because after that, I don't want to spoil any good bits for anyone who is interested in reading this series. Like, don't let my review stop you from having a good time, okay? You like what you like, or if my words make sense to you, then that's that on that. Scattered commentary on pivotal moments. Like the title implies, after the first three chapters, I'll be commenting on pivotal scenes and dialogue that I think are impactful to the story and also just got to me personally. So spoiler alert, final thoughts. This is where I'm going to be honest and address what I think of the series and whether it's a hit or miss in my opinion. This is where the truth comes out. Addressing controversy. If there is any, I'm going to mention it because it's interesting to see what the discourse is surrounding the comic and important to document the buzz surrounding the series for posterity's sake. It also adds a bit of clarity if it's something that can be easily addressed or if it's something we should be mindful of. Similar series recommendations. Because once you leave the series, 
Sometimes you still want to linger and enjoy the vibes the series got you hooked on, or if you want something similar but better executed elsewhere, I got options for you too, with the help of all of you beautiful fans. Now that my process is explained, let's begin. Expectations. So with my first impression, it's basically giving romance between ordinary, but not really, main character and this Markiplier inspired YouTuber love interest who got off on the wrong foot and now happen to be each other's neighbors. Hijinks ensue, slow burn begins, enemies to friends to lovers, and their inevitable endgame is peppered with gaming references and character growth. Basically, it's a cute lighthearted rom-com drama featuring a cast of adults. As delicious as the second male lead is, I think we all know that the endgame couple is going to be Sam and Marshall. Read the first three chapters with me. This segment is obviously titled, Read the First Three Chapters With Me, because I'm inviting you all to read with me as I comment on the chapters in real time, or as real time as it can be, in a pre-recorded video. So onwards and onwards to Let's Play. All right, so already we're getting a notice that the series contains adult themes and situation as recommended for mature audiences. Your discretion advised. Yes, we are proceeding. Which I know this was like a point of contention for the author at the uh, beginning because she did apparently say that she did not think her comic needed a maturity warning. And I know a lot of people agree, disagree and say that it does. Personally, I don't think it needs it because considering what we have in her comic, it's just glimpses and kind of like teaser panels of what could have been if this was actually an explicit comic. Um, if you're trying to figure out what I'm talking about, I do recommend, well, I wouldn't recommend so much as, uh, if you need to find proof of other more explicit comics, The King and a Paladin is a really great example because there is a lot of stuff going on in that comic, which Webtoon has censored, uh, for the platform. It now has like the 16 plus version, uh, but Originally, the comic is an 18 plus version and there is so much going on. And as well as there's a lot of other raunchy stuff going on in the Canvas community, which I know there's like less. Well, there's rules, but they don't really enforce those rules as hard as they should. So I do see where the author is coming from. Again, personally, I don't think it needs the maturity rating uh, warning, but some people disagree. And it is what it is at this point. So we continue. When I was little, I fell in love with gaming. The genre never mattered. The thought of playing as a hero or solving a puzzle awed my young mind. Aw, oh, she's so cute there. By my teens, I gamed competitively, though I lacked what it took to play professionally. In college, I earned my degree in computer science. In school, I worked diligently on creating my first indie game. I spent countless hours working on it. Missing out on nights out with friends. Working nights on my game and going to classes in the day. After college, I submitted my new indie game, Ruminate, to the independent game website, Indigeneer. On this website, new developers can gain a following and get their name out. If you gain a large enough fan base, you might get scouted by a large game company. Ruminate was posted on Indigeneer for a month and the feedback was mostly positive. This is really cute. And I like how like meta this kind of is. It's own little website with the own character uh, having its own little profile and pretty much having like an INDBM, whatever it's called. But for video games, that's pretty cute. My developer score was 8.2 out of 10. This was a great score to have for my first game. I had hoped that by being on Indigeneer, a game company might offer me a job in game development. Bzz, bzz. Unfortunately, things haven't quite worked out that way. Bzz, bzz. So on and so forth. Holy flip. 2,451 new messages. I'm not going to lie. Getting that many messages in a short time frame, that's kind of overwhelming. All right, that Minotaur was too tough for me. Mistakes were made, I admit it. Even if I beat that Minotaur, I still don't know how to escape the maze. And I'm not going to level up unless I kill something. The monsters in this world are really strong, but there are a few goblin chodes over here. I'll use this wooden sword to gank them. Have at you, bonk. Um, problem? 
Ooh, that's a lot of sharp objects in tender places. I think it's safe to say this is the end of the mini lawman. And since I have yet to see any place to save my game, this is the end of my attempt at playing Ruminate. <laughs> Before I finish this video, if the developer of this game watches this, I understand you said this is your first game, but it is currently not playable like this. I do like how, you know, he's adjusting the panel as if it's actually a real camera. I love those attention to details in comics. You're going to anger your players if you put monsters in the world with no way to defeat them, and they'll really hate the game if you don't give them a way to save their progress. What I'm saying is, this game needs a lot of work. I have played a lot of good and bad games as a YouTuber, and I've never played a game where I struggled to progress more than I did in this game. I can tell you tried hard on this game, and you're offering it for free, but you should get more critique for a game before you post it for people to play. Ooh, that's build drink. You know, these are hurtful words. <laughs> Until then, good luck. I guess this is a good point to end the video. Before I close, I wanted to tell you guys that I'm moving. Because of this, I'll be pretty busy over the next few days and might not be able to upload videos on my normal schedule. Oof, don't I hear? <laughs> don't I know that? Don't worry, there will still be two videos posted a day. I could not do something like that, not with my full-time job. Once I'm settled, I'll give you guys a grand tour. But not too much. I don't need any more amorous fans finding out where I live and showing up at my door again. Ah, uh, poor Sam. Look at her score. It's a 0 0.3. That's terrible. That must be like crushing for her, especially if she wanted this to be like a professional career thing. That is just terrible to have. Oh, God. Oh, look at these comments. Marshall was right. This game sucks. He raged so hard at the Minotaur. Lol, lol, lol. What the fuck? How are you supposed to play this game? Shitty game. Have you guys actually played this game? Aw, oh, look at somebody trying to defend. OMG, you made my husband do Marshall angry. Ugh, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Comments like those are really cringy. I don't even know how to program, but I can make a better game with... Oh my god, these people are so obnoxious. Marshall brought me here. Yep. As always, thank you for watching. This is Marshall Law signing out. You know what I really appreciate? Like, the detail in her art like in these initial chapters like look at that Oof. it seemed as though my career as a developer was already over before it had truly started okay okay calm down bowser be careful or you'll trip me just let me lock the door first that's so cute i'm telling you look at the detail on the face like oh like she doesn't do it to this degree in later chapters but initially it's beautiful Although, of course, I understand why she can't produce this level of detail in her later chapters, because it is something that has to be consistently uh, pushed out weekly. And so time is kind of of the essence and you don't want to spend like a thousand hours on a singular panel. OK, she's going. Oh, oh beautiful panel. Boxes. Is someone moving in next door? I wonder who it is. I guess I'll bump into them eventually. I hope they're nice and quiet. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, there goes the uh, classic boob scenario. Yep, there you go. The sensation. Oh, she looks so cute when she's trying to figure out what is standing before her. Ah oh, man, I didn't see you there. Are you all right? His voice, it sounds familiar. Miss, are you okay? Oh, <laughs> the meeting, the supposed meet cute. Uh, problem? You know what's funny? It's the fact that Marshall's hair is so completely different in these first initial chapters than later on in the series. Like in the later on the series, it looks very messy, but here it's like so kind of neat. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's got its intentionality. All right, that's the end of chapter uno. Let's try numero two. Actually, let me look at the comments. Who else loved this when it was on Discover? Yeah, a lot of people were really hyped about this because this was on Canvas originally. Yo, and Discover was the name of Canvas before it, you know, shifted. Yay, the subtune is great, and I'm sure many people agree from looking at it in the Discover section. 
So happy this got featured. It's an amazing webtoon. Yeah. And pretty much everyone was really into this. Bum, 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 bum. All right. Chapter two. Let's see what we got here. Um, problem? H how is this even possible? Uh, miss, where are my glasses? 18 million people in this city and I had to run into him? My luck couldn't get any worse. Oh, do you live here? It looks like we're going to be neighbors. It, it got worse. Oh. oh, he notices that. Oh, you dropped your glasses. Here, let me help you. No, no, I don't need your help. And there goes Bowser. So cute. Bowser, I've never seen him act like that before. Grr, wow, much fierce, such scare. <gasps> Cute. Oh, there we go. Oh, my lord. What a cute little puppy. Cutie little patootie. Who's a good boy? Snuggle, snuggle. Honestly, he really shouldn't be touching stranger dogs. Remember, guys, don't touch uh, dogs that don't belong to you. Especially because you never know what kind of temperament they're going to have. I could just eat you up. <laughs> so cute. Hey, let go of my dog. He doesn't like being held by strangers. Yeah. See what I mean? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to scare him. I just have a soft spot for cute pets. Normally, my introductions go a bit smoother, but... Hi, I'm Martial Law. I know who you are. You're Martial Law, an internet personality with over 3 million followers on YouTube. You are rated as the 67th most popular YouTuber, gaining roughly 125 followers a month. Your videos consist mainly of playing survival horror games, but you also feature the occasional indie game. Oh, wow. Are you an editor for my Wikipedia page? Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> no, I'm not an editor for your Wikia page. My name is Sam Young, and I'm a game developer. You're a game developer? That's awesome. Are you self-taught? What programming languages do you know? Do you work for a company? How long have you been a developer? What games have you worked on? Ruminate. Oh, there we go. Ruminate. Oh, I see. I suppose you've seen my most recent video then. Oh boy, look, Um, what I said about your game, I wasn't trying to be mean. Part of my job is to properly review and critique games, and I'm not really known for sugarcoating things. I know it can be difficult to receive critique on something you've worked hard on, but good and bad reviews come with the business, and it's something you'll have to get used to. Critique? You didn't even play my game correctly. Ruminate is an adventure puzzle game, not a combat RPG like you played it. The goal was to solve the challenges without violence. This was all explained in the introduction. Didn't you read it? Blah, blah, blah. Intro, blah, blah. Ain't nobody got time for that. TLDR. And the intro, <laughs> it's not even that long. Yeah, you know he done fucked up. Yes? figures. Forget it. I don't expect you to care or understand. Hey, I get paid by gaming companies to feature their games and I played yours for free. You got a lot of publicity at no cost. I basically did you a favor. This is so entitled and just really shows he just does not get the harm he truly did to this girl, which is why she pretty much does not like him at first, even though she was like a fan of his. You have no idea what you've done, do you? If you try to do me another favor, I'll sue you for violation of my intellectual property. Ooh, you know she's serious. And that was it for episode two. So interestingly enough, what I loved about episode, well, really the first initial episodes, you know, one and two, is that Sam has a backbone here. You don't really see this too much in the later chapters, but she really had that like, you messed with me. I'm not going to take this lying down kind of attitude. And I really love that for her because like baby girl was definitely a victim. And it was so great for her to stand up for herself, especially when the idiot who pretty much uh, ruined her would be career is over here thinking that he did her a favor. So I really loved just her going all out, being fierce, standing up for herself, because that's what you really got to do in situations like this, especially when the other person doesn't get it and thinks, you know, they're the victim in this. All right, episode three. Last but not least. What I really love about the whole Let's Play is just the vibes you get coming in. Like, yes, it's going to feature gaming elements. And that's pretty cool. 
Okay. Recap from last. Okay. The Daily Grind. Sam, Bowser, you, uh, you doing all right there? I'm ready to log out of life now. Whoa, what happened? Hey, D, I did the inventory. I don't know who is stealing all the toilet paper, but their reign of terror must come to an end. Also, does anyone see Link's initial design, like, compared to, like, later in the series to now? It is so different. He's, like, so much less buffier. He's got less definition in his body. Like, oh, my God, it's so different. It's, it's quite startling, really. Later, Link. Sam, what happened? Are you all right? Link, it's my game. Ruminate. If you two replayed Ruminate and gave it a bad review, then his fans zerged my indie dev page and they fragged my developer rating to the point that my account has been flagged. Link, was that English? I knew some of those words. An internet celebrity named Martial Law played my game and recorded a negative review of it. He then posted the video on YouTube for everyone to see. Then thousands of his fans who saw the video went to my developer site and gave my game a poor rating. Because of this, my account has been suspended, and I can't post any new games or apply to jobs through the developer site. Yeah, that's a real bummer. Isn't there someone you can talk to at Indigeneer? I'm telling you, his design is so different. It freaks me out. I filed an inquiry with their customer service. The automated response said they'll contact me in 48 hours. Surely the staff will understand what happened and fix this mess. Yeah, it hardly seems fair. I don't know. I've heard of this happening to other developers when their game has gone viral, but the site didn't restore their rating. Sorry, Sam. If we can help in any way, let us know. Yeah. Thanks, guys. D. Link. Angela needs caffeine badly. That's kind of corny. <laughs> Vicky, too, please. Also, this romper is like odd at in a bag of chips. Sam? You've been crying. Who? Who made you cry? I will beat the shit out of them. Oh, my. Angela, Vicky, what are you two doing here so early? Oh, Sam, darling, Ack, don't cry. Vicky and Angela are here. Everything is going to be just fine. No more tears. There, there. Vicky, it's okay, really. Hey, Sam, how about a coffee and a walk? Y yeah. I see. No wonder you were so upset. Damn that martial law. I'm going to kick his ass. Assault would be unwise. Well, what else am I supposed to do? He's really screwed Sam over. I've got to do something. Though it is true he did play Rubini incorrectly, it was Marshall's fans that took action against Sam. Not Marshall himself. It sounds like his fans are more to blame in this instant. His fans? But why would they do that? Because literally parasocial relationships is terrible. He has millions of fans and they all think my game is terrible. Will this ruin my reputation as a developer? And what if he's right? Is Rubini a bad game? No, girl, it is not. Do not let these people get to you. Remember, guys, believe in yourself. I know it's very easy to be, you know, swayed by outsider influences. But if you truly believe that whatever project you have, that you put your heart and soul into it is good, it is good. Now, if it is actually terrible, then honestly, have your trusted circle to give you objective, honest feedback. But otherwise, you guys are good. In this instant, though, in this comic, Sam's pretty good, so don't let the bad haters get to you, girly. Oop, she's gasping. Gas, gas, cough, cough. Oh, inhaler. S sorry, it's okay. He was wrong, Sam. Ruminate is a good game. She's right. Sure, it's a bit different than most games out there, but that's part of what makes it so great. Thanks, guys. I really needed to hear that. Of course, we're your biggest fans. On a fun note, you want to come over and see my progress on my Manslayer cosplay? I'm making chicken dumplings. Thanks, but no. I'm down to my last pair of underwear, and if I don't do a load of laundry, I'll have to go commando tomorrow. Haha, <laughs> gross. Do you need us to walk you back to your apartment in case you bump into Marshmallow again? That's a great name. I appreciate the offer, but I'll be fine on my own. Are you sure? I know how much you hate confrontation. Literally, she confronted this man already. Like, she did such a good job. No hesitation. Let him know what's what. And all of a sudden, hates confrontation. See, this part kind of like confused me because of how, you know, suddenly indifferent it was. But whatever. It will be fine. I'm sure I'll manage. What? <laughs> there we go. 
haha, did you see martial law's latest video? Yeah, that game looked like complete shit. I know, right? I could build a better game in less than 24 hours. <sighs> you guys can't see me, but my eyes are literally rolling in the back of their head right now. I hope he plays a real game soon. Haha, <laughs> yeah. Ugh. And yeah, that was pretty much episode three. So, conclusion. Very promising premise. We do love that enemies to lovers type trope that's going on here right now. Uh, also, the gaming elements are really fun. I've forgotten pretty much just how detailed the art was in the beginning. And of course, Link's very different design because that man buffed up in like 10 episodes later. So, yeah, very promising premise. Later on, obviously, the story continues on. Some people like it. Others hate it. It is what it is. It's not bad. Not bad. Now, I will go on to the next segment of this review, which basically is me commenting on pivotal parts. If you would like to tell me what you guys think in the comments, go ahead and do so. I know a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about uh, Let's Play. Again, I think the opening uh, couple episodes is fine. This pretty much solidified the popularity of Let's Play for the next foreseeable couple of years. And obviously, with any popularity, you're going to have you know, very polarizing reactions to the content. If you guys want to have more of these, read the first three chapters slash whatever else with me, I will definitely be doing that in the future because it is pretty fun to do these read-alongs and I do appreciate, you know, performing this activity together. You, me, just having a great time reading some comics. It's always fun. And now I will be taking it up to my other portion of the video. And that is going to be the scattered commentary on pivotal moments section. Uh, there's going to be a lot of episodes that I will have to read through. So I'm really going to only post my comments on the ones that were pivotal that are pretty much interesting to point out and any pet peeves or twos that I see and just anything else worth noting. So let's have fun with that. Scattered commentary on pivotal moments. For this segment, there's a lot of episodes, so I'm going to comment on the ones that were pivotal, are interesting to point out, a pet peeve or two, and anything else worth noting. So let's start with episode four, The Conexión. We could have had this instead of all of the drama, not gonna lie. Also, Marshall be looking fine with that smirk. Like, Bish, what did you expect? You ruined her game developer career before it even started and spoke to her like a jerkwad. Two things. One, Sam's chest is definitely smaller initially in the series. Her redesign feels like they're huge, which I don't mind large chesty girl representation because same, but something about this not being the case for her from the start doesn't feel genuine. Like it's not done to show representation, but more so because since the boys are drawn hot, we gotta amp up Sam's hotness too, i.e. huge boobs. Also two, Charles looks so boyish in this panel. I can't stomach it first impressions, and he's already a polite and thoughtful gentleman when he didn't even need to be. Never mind, he's an asshole. Even though I love Charles, this is evidence number two that Marshall is endgame. Generally, the accidental rule of thumb when it comes to romance and love interests is that the main character's true love interest tends to have a similar personality trait or some visual similarity to one of the beloved parents of the main character, and vice versa. I know this sounds weird or extra to some, and I can't even explain why, but this has always been a thing I notice with couples and romance in media. It's not always accurate, but it's a trend, and nine times out of 10, it never fails me unless the author is being intentional. See, this is cute. The nerdy elements of gaming, the niche references, and how Mongi adds it to the overall aesthetic to her comic is what sets it apart from the rest. There's consistency and vibes, and as we all know, the girlies love the vibes. And by girlies, I do mean he's, they's, and everyone in between. Girlies is my gender neutral term. But continuing on, personally, I'm not a huge video game nerd, but I appreciate the references and incorporation of the video game elements in the story. However, when I signed up for Let's Play, it was because it was a romance first and video game second type story. I know this upsets some people, but again, I stress, this is a romance first story. That's how it was advertised and categorized from the jump. 
I know some people would prefer more focus on gaming elements, and I wouldn't mind it either. But if I'm not seeing the progression character chemistry and romance progression, I'm a dip. If I wanted to see more gamer stuff, I could just go to another webcomic that focuses more heavily on it, which I have a great recommendation in the recommended section, so stay tuned. So the intro of Girlfriend Monica was unexpected, but another great obstacle for the main story. I love her design, especially the pink hair. It's very on the nose for a beauty influencer, but I'll accept it. With her introduction, it also makes me wonder how this relationship and Marshall's like engagement with Sam would be handled going forward. It can either be handled great or go cliche. We shall see. Evidence number three that Marshall is endgame. An attentive man who notices and caters to the main character's needs and gives her comfort, even if he is a taken man himself. That's called being considerate. This was hilarious, and his amused reaction to it is everything. But also he's taken, so. Bruh, same. The fact that Sam was so fierce and stood her ground and suddenly she's this tongue-tied wallflower always bothered me because she literally just gave this guy a tongue lashing that was well-deserved in their first meeting. Don't back check now on me, girly. It's cool if you're shy and nervous and don't know what to say, but at a certain point, it gets annoying if you don't at least communicate in some way. Like, it doesn't have to be direct. The note that Sam left for Marshall in the apartment complex like a couple chapters ago when he was like making too much noise, that was perfect. That's all she needed to do. Why is Sam holding her chest like that? She's such a dumbass. That only emphasizes what she's hoping gets ignored. If you wanna have more coverage, how about you cross your arms over your chest, not under it. Like, use your cerebro, I swear to Bob. LMAO, Charles is so delusional. You acted like a jerk and don't give her assignments worth her skill and you expect her to come to you for wardrobe emergencies? Well, well, well. If it isn't the consequences of your own actions. Now Marshall is seeing his careless attitude has affected Sam and why she was so hostile towards him at first. This was so unnecessary, LMAO. There was no need to be shirtless when he literally could have given her the spare he had, like bruh. Also, Charles noticing her figure and this beginning his attraction to her was just elegantly done. The curvature of her body was gorgeous and emphasized his attraction without it coming across as sleazy or leering. But also, why is he sitting like that? That's so weird. Now see, this is hot. Love us some courage and assertiveness. And she was a fan. Evidence number four of why Sam and Marshall are endgame. It's a cute full circle monkey included that should they get together, Marshall will essentially end up marrying a loyal fan and Sam will end up marrying her YouTube idol. And isn't that what romance books and the book talk slash booktube girlies love? Also, his hair is long. I love the attention to detail to illustrate his earlier, less put together phase of his life. This bitch still missed the mark. At this point, Link became a potential red herring love interest. A red herring is a clue or piece of information that is or is intended to be misleading or distracting and Link just ticked all the boxes. I more or less knew that Sam would be dating and then eliminating Link and Charles to eventually get to Marshall. You know, after Marshall breaks up with Monica, of course. As a result, I kind of lost interest in Link and found him irrelevant because I wanted a real love interest with actual chemistry that would have to make Marshall step up his game and Link, as adorable and as much of a golden retriever as he is, was not the one to challenge Marshall. Smooth. As much of a professional jerk Charles is, he's actually very thoughtful and observant, thinking of Sam's asthma and also offering up further steps for her to pursue fencing when he thought she was actually interested in that. See, this is what I mean, thoughtful. He didn't have to. The spine is back, y'all, let's go. I'm so soft for this, I swear to Bob. She still wants his opinion of her game after everything. Now this is a link I can believe in. His earlier design looked so odd compared to the more full body one. Like he's still kind of met to me, but I love his gentle golden retriever energy here. I like that Charles explains his rationale over his professional jerk treatment of Sam. He certainly has merit at considering he's her current boss until she takes over. It would kind of behoove him to test her and professionally groom her, not sexually like some people are so ready to accuse, but to fully prepare her to take over her father's position once he steps down. And all of this information Charles knows was because he was told by Sam's father, his boss, so Charles isn't doing all of this stuff just for kicks. And he apologized for his professional jerk behavior. We stand a man who shows accountability and shows changed behavior. 
Sam notices Charles is injured after ogling him beforehand. It is Charles that requests privacy at first and reminds Sam of their boundaries, pointing this out in case anyone accuses this man of some terrible crimes he did not commit. See, Sam and Link could have been cute. His gentleness could have suited Sam and she was beginning to recognize her own sexuality. Love that for her, but then Link had to ruin it. Okay, not gonna lie, I find this part of Marshall's personality who becomes too much, very annoying. Like he goes overboard and feels kind of cringe with the baby puppy talk replacing real words. Doggo, pupper, etc., are fine, but he uses it too much here. And I personally find it so cringy when I have to read it. Okay, but like la confusion. Okay, so Charles didn't betray Sam's confidence. He just lied to the dad so she can get more out of her job like she wanted without letting him know she's not interested. Charles for the win. Also, his face is starting to look less boyish. I appreciate that. So that is very offensive to me. I do not play around with a deportation joke. Threatening Charles in this way because he's a potential male suitor for Sam is disgusting to me. Another reason why Sam's dad is trash to me personally. And it's not the first time he's threatened Charles with deportation. Why is Charles the problem character here? <laughs> Lol, okay, Edward Cullen. That's messed up. How is the professionalism and dedicated work ethic for the company that Charles contributes makes him the villain? How is having the skills at management teamwork and getting the job done for the benefit of their company a bad thing? Like, yeah, Charles can see an opportunity and seize it, but that doesn't make people terrible for knowing how to manipulate it when it suits them. If they use that skill to harm others and take advantage at the expense of others purposefully, that is when there's a problem. This intense dislike with Sam's dad and Jay against Charles is disrespectful and foul, especially when Charles has not done anything to harm anyone or the young family. It really goes to show you, your job will always use you until you can't be used anymore. And then they replace you when they squeeze anything good from you. Honestly, Marshall playing the game and finding the credit dedicated to him was such a poignant full circle. I do appreciate how Mungi connects everything even when it seems like it shouldn't. Marshall's sister, Sam having added a credit to Marshall Law only for him to have trashed her game, etc. Was Sam trying to make Charles a bit jealous? Probably because of what he said about Monica and how attentive he was towards Ava, which is ironic because you can tell Ava is a bit jealous over Charles's attentiveness towards Sam. Typical male. That shit was so hilarious, like fucking finally Sam. Bitch, why would you phrase it like that? I had a feeling Sam was only doing this because of Charles. And not because she wants him, but because she was a bit put out that Charles chose to stay behind and hand her off. I think she likes how attentive he is towards her. This entire episode is wholesome for Sam. Charles did not have to bother with Sam's self-deprecating attitude and could have just ignored her but he chose to help her see that there's more to love about herself, even if her current office outfits aren't the greatest, which is true, she dresses like an elderly banker. Also, Charles is the way that he is in this episode in episode 86, because Sam wanted to do more, but to do more that will serve her well in her game developer dreams, she will need to speak to clients and at least be social in a professional setting. So it may sound harsh, but he's being truthful and reasonable and also speaking to her in a calm professional tone. The way Sam just tanked a cell for her company, lol. For any haters, Charles was acting angry and jerkish as a strategy to seal the deal. He wasn't actually angry at Sam and he didn't act rude towards her either. Don't you just love it when Sam grows into her own and her confidence is literally what Charles loves. Casual hair Charles. I'm screaming y'all. I'm figuratively screaming right now. Honestly, the teasing wasn't that bad. Anyone would think she meant sex with the way she says it, but as always, Charles is mindful of Sam's fragility. She's so fucking fragile. How are you gonna blur everything and then not let him respond? I know he wanted truth, but be mindful. You can't info dump and backtrack without letting the other party respond. If Sam were uncomfortable, she should have been vague or changed the subject instead of intimating that there was more to the answer and promoting Charles to wonder why it was that Sam didn't sleep well. Thank the Lord Charles is so patient with her. Other men would not have been and Sam is really the type of person who needs patience and courtesy in her life. Baby girl is feeling it. So this was my beef with Dean. He was just a straight up stereotype of the charming Latin man, which would have been fine had he not been the only Latino character there. Because he's the only one, his whole persona feels like a stereotype and the fact that he throws unnecessary Spanish around as if to emphasize he's Latino every few moments 
is so annoying. I appreciate Mongi for trying, but I think the thing about writing characters from cultural backgrounds is to see them as people first, like make them as a character interesting first before you add cultural elements. Overall, I did not enjoy Dean as our Latino representation and Latino as an adjective to anything is cringy. Dean isn't defined by his Latinidad alone. I will admit that Charles does tend to get close to someone's personal space in order to persuade them to his point of view and it's quite a genius manipulation tactic. Now, would you look at this? Sam is doing the same thing Charles did to her to get him to present the project instead. Our girl is learning to stand up for herself and also manipulate this boy into caving. Honestly, Sam is not that naive or as defenseless or a child. She's a grown ass woman who understands the nuances of feelings. Yes, she's new because she is a young adult, but she's not stupid or an infant. People need to realize that this is a character that has an understanding and empathy for people. And just because she's a virgin, it doesn't negate all of her life experiences up until that point. Listen, after a while, Sam's father is just an abusive boss. He broke Charles's phone because he took a picture of him breaking down when he could have just asked to have the photos deleted after he was all better or even ordered Charles to delete said photos. Honestly, I would hate to have Charles's job because I'd be stuck reporting to an overly emotional man who does as he please like destroying my property and yelling at me for being too close to his daughter who works under me like bruh. Nepotism is annoying and Charles is taking this like a champ, helping Sam because she's upset over her father's breakdown. See, this is where I kind of have to side with Charles here. He shouldn't have lied about knowing Sam's mom's phone number, but considering Sam asked him to intervene, it was the best strategy to get his boss out of his funk. And Charles is right. Everyone manipulates everyone over something. It can be as little as persuading a child to stop screaming in a restaurant to malicious things like scamming people out of their money. It's how you use it that's the problem. Otherwise, in an ideal world, manipulating someone just would be bad, point blank period. That's my two cents on this. I go into more detail about this actually in my in defense of Charles video on my channel. So check that out if you're interested about why I come to Charles's defense. See, Sam also lies by omission, which is just as bad. Charles has a point. See what I mean? Yeah, I hate these kinds of jokes that belittle the origins of where people come from. For some people, it's important that others know the distinction because there is so little representation already out there for certain cultures. In this case, because Wales is so underrepresented and kind of seen as unimportant in pop culture compared to England or Scotland, I'd be hella annoyed that this girl over here is just like reducing my country and culture to nothing. This entire chapter is pure steam. I'm literally melting. Charles honestly handled Sam's interest in him and his and her very well. Like as spontaneous kissing goes, it's good that he doesn't get too lost in himself in the moment and was able to temper Sam's eagerness. And it's also good Charles plainly laid out what he does and does not want from the relationship. The line has been drawn and Sam understands the rules. He does not want anything serious, no companion, no emotional availability. And I love that Sam will not just take Charles lying down at face value. She does have the guts to tell him to his face in what she believes in, even despite her dislike for confrontation and anxiety. I remember people were so unhinged and just bashing Charles for being a rapist and groomer when the man has done nothing. It's all just a cliffhanger and following his character's logic, Charles would not be inappropriate with Sam unless she consensually agrees when she's sober. She may be hot and he may be a hot blooded male, but Charles isn't a monster. Like be fucking for real. Because duh, Charles wouldn't do it. He literally threw himself off the bed to make sure Sam didn't hit her head, y'all. How is this pornographic and explicit? Maybe his mouth by her cleavage is hot, but it's not explicit. Sam's orgasm is the most tame reference to it I have ever seen. And I've seen some things. I told you that there are still hints of Sam Marshall Endgame. It's just a slow burn, but you still get stuff like this sprinkled in. Honestly, I'm curious to know what this specifically meant because I have my opinions on what it could be. And I just wanna know what it officially means. Again, great use of visual representation. I like Vicky and how she explains the feeling of control because a lot of people give their own interpretation that villainized Charles, even though there's no evidence. Charles was the one who was like not emotionally available and now he is the one into her as more than a benefits friend. Sam here is aware of the boundaries set forth by Charles and abides by them. Good on her. I'm glad Charles is able to realize that his behavior towards Ava because of his blue balls with Sam is not right and admits that to himself. Remember sparkling individuals, we stand a man who can hold himself accountable and show changed behavior. Charles is so weak. 
But seriously, it's wild how Sam's line by line coding has got this man thirsty. And for any naysayers that Sam didn't want it and she's being taken advantage of, I beg to differ. Also, it's quite inappropriate in general to have your male boss come inside your apartment where you two will be alone and have him zip up a dress that you're not even wearing a bra in knowing you guys engage in some having petting recently. But she knew that. She knew what she was doing. What's with the real people? This is so jarring. I know people had complaints about like the 3D like background assets that Monkey used for the series. And personally, I don't really find them like all that disturbing or out of place. But this, in this case though, this panel right here with the real people, that shit was weird. I just, I just wanted to throw my sense in there. Ugh, another annoying example of Dean. This is okay, but the rest was stupid. This right here, Charles should be upfront to Sam about his previous partners so that situations like this don't come across as shady. However, if Charles is panicking because he fears Ava is going to cause a scene and make Sam uncomfortable or harm her verbally, then I understand his panic. However, he still needs to speak to Sam about his ex-partners. Yes, this is very good to know about your partner, especially if you are pursuing something with him that might lead to something serious. I love how intuitive Sam is about Charles and letting him know what's what. I love how considerate Charles is to Sam. I don't know where people are getting like this monster title uh, from him, like honestly. Protections were used, y'all. Good man. Now what's this? I am literally done with Sam's father. This can easily cause distrust and Sam distancing herself from her dad if he interferes with her autonomy. Being protective can become overprotective and that's a slippery slope of harming father-daughter relations. I honestly thought Eva, 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 however you say her name, and Charles would have been like another Link and Angela, but they're really bad for each other. Also called it that Ava would harm Sam verbally or something similar if she saw her with Charles. That shit is not a cute look on Ava when she and Charles are not even dating nor have any understanding aside from a casual fling every now and then. Okay, but I love Charles and Bowser's relationship the most. You can just tell Bowser adores Charles. He's going to be the one most hurt should this relationship not work out. Honestly, unless Charles tells her otherwise, Sam shouldn't think that Charles doesn't like her because it's very much the opposite, but that's for Charles to tell her. Honestly, people are so quick to say Charles is manipulative, but this entire adventure was initiated by Sam. Like, the fuck? It's so wholesome, I could scream. She understood the assignment too well, lol. I was afraid of this. This either means Charles will be controlling slash possessive or will do what he can to ensure Sam is his. It's funny how people are quick to demonize him when he hasn't yet shown any actions that warrant that label. Um, and if you don't like Sam with Charles, just say that instead of finding reasons that villainizes Charles. Once he shows the actions that, you know, are bad, then we can start naming names. I sincerely hope this isn't Charles' reliance on Sam to save him because he needs to do that on his own. Charles, what is you doing? But I'm glad he realized the parallel and that he was about to act unhinged. Charles boy, snap out of it. You can't let Gwyneth and her bitch ass actions dictate your fears and ruin future healthy relationships. He's got it bad for Sam and wants to monopolize her time, but he has yet to ask her to be in an exclusive relationship with him. So unless he is bringing a boyfriend girlfriend label to the table, I need him to calm the fuck down. Also, good on Sam for not dropping everything when Charles gives her attention. Like that's a slippery slope for those of you new to the friends with benefits label. You know he tried to hit on the mom while he was distraught and drunk. Bruh, Sam is so manipulative. How you gonna say that when this man is hungry for you and you won't see him until next week? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Also, what does the golden chains mean? They don't look like they're causing Sam harm. In fact, to me, it looks as though the controlling thing is being neutralized by Sam almost. But with an opponent like past trauma causing Gwen, it boils down to the question of if Sam is willing to deal with Charles's baggage, especially since they're not exclusive or in an official relationship. Oh, please explain, Sam. It's good that Sam knows what she wants in Charles, Honestly, I think it would be better for them if Charles wasn't her boss if she dates him officially. Sounds like she would rather have his softer sides when he isn't putting up a mask. This is good to discover for herself and let Charles know so that they can adjust accordingly going forward. I suppose he's not obligated to tell Sam because they're not dating, but if he keeps being this needy, something's gotta give. Okay, Sam would like to cuddle. Charles, 
what's your move? In the end, they cuddled. Good on Charles. Oh, and would you look at that? They're both wearing clothes on still. You don't just do the do and then put on your tops and then cuddle after. You didn't, It's kind of mm, consensus here. They did not do it. Boy, settle down now. You have no right to be jealous when you're not dating. And your cop consequences. And the end for now. Thoughts? Because I have many. Final thoughts. After reading and laying on my bed, staring at the ceiling and processing what my eyeballs took in, I have summed up my thoughts on Let's Play to the following. Let's Play is a comic with potential. The premise of Idol disparaging fans' work inspired by his line of business and then being forced to live next to each other is what comedy romances are made out of. It's refreshing that we're also taking a harder look into their lives to see Sam grow into herself and discover the truth that Marshall isn't living an ideal life despite his job. It fleshes them out as characters. The chemistry that the two main characters, you know, have makes it more natural. And you can just really see hints of the end game sprinkled around. Monkey's art is also good. For a comic that publishes episodes weekly, she still delivers high quality panels and decent backgrounds. As you saw in the read with me portion, her stuff was super detailed in the beginning. And while I appreciate her for trying to deliver the very best, it just wasn't realistic, so I don't fault her for her more simplistic approach to later episodes. Ducky lips aside, I do like the redesigns she gave everybody, specifically for Link and Charles, who became buffer and more filled out and less boyish. Not that there's anything wrong with a boyish and linky look, considering how we all grew used to the look they have now, the difference in the beginning was pretty jarring, at least for me. Characters for everyone was okay. Sam as a main character can be a bit of a hit or miss for people. She's logical and laid back and kind, but she can be a bit of a pushover. This is a good basis for character growth, but it also makes her kind of boring and frustrating at times. She was amazing as a character in the first two chapters of the series, but then it fluctuates. Like she really stands out when she finally stands up for herself and learns to live outside her overprotective bubble that her friends and family surround her with. Her design is whatever. It's not outstanding or interesting. It's honestly pretty generic, but it'll do. I'm hoping she'll look more interesting in the time skip at the end. Diversity wise, I liked the diversity Monkey was trying to bring to the table, but sometimes it felt a little too tokeny. And yes, I do mean Dean. You already heard my opinion on the matter earlier and constantly making him the charismatic Latino stereotype that has to throw in random Spanish to get the point across that he's spicy and different, personally rubbed me the wrong way. It didn't feel genuine and constantly served to remind me that he's the only Latino character in the comic in a sea of whites. Sure, you got your sprinkled in people of color, but honestly, you can kind of count them all in one hand. D, Umed, Abe, Jay's girlfriend, and Dean himself. That's more than other comics artists have included, which I appreciate, but honestly, I'm kind of tired of people forcing themselves to add more diverse characters and doing nothing with them. This point wouldn't be as big of a deal to mention had Dean not been used to make a spectacle of himself and remind me that some people just really don't know how to write characters from different cultural backgrounds that isn't American or fully American. I know this isn't the full point of the story. It is a comedy romance, so the main focus is on Sam and the boys, but I think this is a great example to be mindful of how people of color are being used in a story. It's all too easy to default to white characters of the American culture, especially if it's all one has ever known. Remember, there is a wider, bigger world out there than the bubble we live in. Continuing on, as far as secondary characters go, I'm not into Angela and I have no interest in her relationship with Link. I get what Monkey is trying to do, but personally their romance is just not my thing. I do love Sam's mom and her father's romance. I think that's very genuine. However, y'all know I loathe her father. Thus, his behavior can get way too clingy sometimes. The mom is all that in a bag of chips, so good for her for securing a man who sees her as the queen she is. Now we need Sam to realize she deserves the same. I love Monica and Vicky. Everyone is met in my eyes. Eva is annoying purely because she comes across as a hypocrite to me and just really mean for no reason. Maybe this changes in the future, but I honestly don't care. Abe is fantastic and I honestly can't remember anybody else. Plot wise, this series has something going on. Considering it's a romance comedy, the exploration we get with each of the male love interests is nice because in this way, you can explore Sam's character growth and learn more about these handsome individuals. Do I think there were certain aspects that could have been better explored in the series? Sure, absolutely. At times, we seem to focus on certain characters that I have no interest in, i.e. Angela and Link, Link's little brother, Sam's father's crisis, etc. 
Maybe it's because of how they're written or because they add no value to the main plot. To me personally, whatever the case, the series would drag in these moments and just kind of make it boring. Some of you might disagree and that's fine. I think these character arcs could have been better incorporated so that they don't seem like we're taking a commercial break from the romance adventures of Sam, Charles, and Marshall. I would have loved to see a bit more emphasis on Sam's developer career. I think Marshall's past is fine, even if it is coming along at a snail's pace. Would love to see him do more with his artistic side though. The romance comedy in the series is I would say a 7 out of 10. Like, I'll buy what Monkey is selling me. Like, I believe it. I do think the series is giving me a refreshing view of exploring the first of many things for some people, i.e. sex, romance, friendships, workplace responsibilities, accountability, etc. I love how things like anxiety, depression, self-control, jealousy, etc. is able to be explored in a visual metaphor that's not so intimidating. It's not anything too deep, mind you, or something that can replace therapy, but it's a decent start to introduce the topics and get you thinking. The ending. I just wanted to quickly talk about episode 177. As far as endings go, that was hella terrible. I think I would have been fine if we left it at Sam finding Charles holding her phone, but adding the additional element of Sam's father and, and how he has a spy network for his daughter feels kind of like a letdown. I'm sure as comedy hit jinx goes, it's fine, but it feels kind of boring when we have bigger fish to fry. Maybe it would have been more dramatic if we got some panel with Marshall realizing he has a crush on Sam or Ava discovering Charles is dating someone and her wanting to know who it is or something else with the secondary characters that would up the ante. Unfortunately, the season three finale was lackluster and disappointing. It gave me nothing to think about and kind of even made me lose interest in season four. Honestly, Charles is the only one that's keeping me going here. I do want to add that I understand that Monkey parted ways with Webtoon, so this last episode probably wasn't her idea of a finale and was made abruptly and with little flavor because of how things just broke off. But man, was it a letdown regardless of all that. Overall, Let's Play has potential. It's not the best romance comedy out there in media, but it has its own unique spin and story to tell. Is it awful? No. Is it a masterpiece? No. Can it improve and be better? Absolutely. This series is not garbage considering it was able to capture a large audience on Webtoon and win several webcomic awards. Even to this day, it's still pretty popular and has like a consistent and loyal fan base willing to wait for season four and Monkey's new dating sim game as well. Heck, even I'm one of those people willing to wait for her comic and see where she takes it. Let's Play has success written under its belt and will continue to garner audience adoration. It's not universally loved, but then no piece of media ever will be. So here's my question. Was this series everything it set out to be in the beginning? Honestly, no. I feel like the premise that it promised was not what it delivered after the first two chapters. The first two chapters was everything. The third kind of dragged, even if it was necessary to introduce the secondary characters, but because I wasn't impressed with the secondary characters themselves, it kind of felt boring. The action only really picked up when we got introduced to Charles and later Marshall realizing his fans tanked Sam's developer score and him playing her game. Sam's growth throughout the series is great too because we love to see a character grow into her own, especially if it's from an insecure one with major anxiety and confrontation issues. Sam's happy ever after has to be earned and she is definitely putting in the work. I also love the difference in love interests that we got. Like their personalities is pretty unique to each of them and they look different. They can all compliment her and her goals depending on whichever way she leans towards. Minus Link, of course. Let's Play is a good series, which can read better now since it has a majority of its episodes already published. I know some stories do better when people can binge it. Um, and this series I think is one of those stories. Again, it's not a masterpiece and Mongi's original vision was probably all by whatever restrictions Webtoon had put into place, but as it is published now, it's an enjoyable romance comedy if you're into a slow burn mystery love angle end game with like nerdy gaming elements. The guys are hot, and while the main character herself isn't the most interesting, she's not the worst. Is this series one that I would buy a physical print of to put in my bookshelves? No, I would not. So personally, I would rate this series 3.5 stars out of five. Addressing controversy and adding my opinions. No piece of media is ever immune to some form of controversy, whether it's actually a big deal 
or imagined by a few individuals. Let's Play and its creator is no exception. What started from not getting enough gaming elements to finding Charles too creepy and sexual began to morph into allegations that were truly unhinged, especially because none of the allegations were that serious. Something to note here is the divorce between Mongi and Webtoon around November of 2022. The news came out of left field that Mongi would be leaving Webtoon despite the obvious discontent between creators on the platform and Webtoon. A few months prior in the landscape of Twitter before it became known as X, a lot of Webtoon original creators began to expose their working conditions and pretty much the lack of pay, promotions, and general lack of respect by Webtoons despite being contracted artists. If you weren't making the company buku bucks and getting millions of views per episode, the platform did not seem interested in you or helping your series grow like it was promised in the contract signed by both parties. At the time this discontent was being expressed, Mongi was already on a hiatus after the finale of Let's Play Season 3. We heard news from her that she was taking a break and a date for Season 4 had yet to be announced. It seemed when the drama of the billboard ads in the summer of 2022 came out, where Webtoon had approved an ad describing making comics as a side hustle despite how labor intensive it really is, everyone's truth began to make it into the spotlight. On November 29th of 2022, Mongi came out with a sudden statement literally as I was finishing editing my Decline of Webtoon video, which you can click to watch after this video. In this statement posted on Twitter, Instagram, and her personal website, Monkey described how she could no longer work with Webtoon and that it was a culmination of several reasons rather than just when it had been ongoing instead of a sudden event. She goes on to describe that some of the concerns include Let's Play being excluded from marketing despite Webtoon promising her otherwise, age restricting Let's Play, and making her feel marginalized in general to name a few. With the atmosphere surrounding Webtoons failing, it seemed destined that Mongi would part ways from a company no longer putting its creator's best interests forward. Lack of pay, lack of respect, and lack of contractual obligation seemed to pretty much spell the end of Let's Play on Webtoon. Mongi's divorce with Webtoon was the first public announcement of its kind. As personally, I think some smaller original artists were also made to exit in some form or another. I can only say that I'm happy for Mongi if she felt this was the right move for her and her comic. Like, there's nothing I loathe more than staying in a toxic working environment that does nothing but waste your time and drain your energy. So Mongi, good luck with any and all future endeavors out there, girly. Cheers. Now looping back to Let's Play controversies. With the big one out of the way, I can name the smaller ones that surround the comic. Lack of gaming elements. This was one I noticed a lot of people voice because of how the premise of the comic was formed. It promised pure nerdy fun and lots of fun references. However, as the story progressed, it seemed like the gaming elements were missing. Personally, I think we just had enough gamer references and plenty of gameplay moments like when Marshall played Ruminate the second time and when Sam and her friends play World of Warcraft. Believe it or not, there's lots of scenes or mentions of it in the comic. However, I do see the point for some people because after a while with the distraction of Sam's office romance with Charles, it does veer away from the gamer related fun. But again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The whole point of Let's Play is to focus on the romance between Sam and her potential love interests. It's a drama, comedy, romance, not an adventure story set within a video game. I think we just have enough gaming elements for it to be fun, but not miss the point of the story. Explicit material. A lot of people have pointed out that they feel Let's Play has become this soft corn story because of how strongly Sam has awakened into her sexuality. Normally, I'm completely fine with people coming into their own and realizing that sexy times is nothing to be ashamed of, especially if they are newbies. But when this critique came up, I decided to reread the story to see if maybe I just missed it and people were right. And surprise, surprise, I was not crazy and I feel like people might be making Sam's sexy time scenes more sexy than they really are. Granted, there are some scenes that are steamy because I do remember that, but it's nothing I would label as like corn or explicit. Sure, it'll have me giggling, but not gasping with my eyes wide open and my jaw drop. There is never a ton of exposure of skin or full on how to illustrations. Innuendos, plenty. And Sam's big orgasm was actually pretty tame, personally. I've seen some orgasmic faces drawn y'all and thank God that Sam's face was not anything like that. Still, I know some people will disagree and that's their prerogative, but it's hardly the end of the world. Mongi is right that there are some comics on the Webtoon platform that are far worse and should definitely be age restricted, but are not for whatever reason. It probably feels like the comic has turned very sexy because of how endless time seems when uploading weekly. What's supposed to be an arc that spans in a few weeks in fiction 
feels like months to us. I have a feeling that after season three, Charles and Sam will be on the fritz because of what happened and Marshall and Sam begin to bond more. Of course, Mongi could choose differently, but we'll see. Sam Charles age difference. I won't go too into detail about this complaint and controversy because I do address it more thoroughly in my In Defense of Charles video, which you can watch after this video. But to make a long story short, Sam is 22 and Charles, to my shock, is somewhere between 26 and 30 according to several sources. I could have sworn he was 30, but apparently there's no confirmation of his age anywhere. If anyone can confirm his age, whether he said it in a panel I missed or Monkey herself confirmed it somewhere, please let me know because now I feel like the Mandela effect finally caught me. Anyways, the point is there's an age difference between Sam and Charles. It's not a significant difference and their relationship wasn't one started while she was underage or when he was waiting for her to grow up. They literally met at work and while Charles is her boss, he never uses his position of power or experience to coerce, harass, or threaten Sam into starting a relationship with him. Like, never. He doesn't even think of it. I know some people mention that there's like a power imbalance or power dynamic between the two because he is the boss who has power over her. And to that I say, you're not wrong. But also please stop using words you heard in therapy as a gotcha moment because there is no gotcha moment. A power imbalance implies that something is happening to both sides that would tip the scales in favor of one side. Both Charles and Sam seem to be benefiting from their situationship that both parties agree to enter without coercion from each other. They're willingly involved with each other and our girl Sam even went so far as to entice Charles. Sam's job at work is not suffering or under threat of termination. In fact, she even got promoted after she asked Charles to do more work that would benefit her long-term career goals. In conclusion, no power imbalance. Just because a boss is a boss to an employee does not mean that there is a power imbalance. It is only a power imbalance if the boss is using and abusing the powers and responsibilities associated with their position for selfish gain. Something Charles does not do in the series, especially towards Nepo baby Sam. One word from her and you can bet that her father would have fired Charles in a heartbeat. So whose job is really under threat from being involved here? Charles. I feel like this man is the one everyone seems to have beef with and I don't understand the visceral hate and accusations. Like I can understand regular hate because we all hate something, whether that's with the reason or not, but the amount of wild accusations thrown at Charles for actions he did not do is astounding. I already talk about this point at length in my defense of Charles video, so I'm just gonna cut it right here. The only thing I can actually accuse Charles of being is emotionally unavailable and a total Capricorn. Enough said. Similar series recommendations. One last thing, for those of you who would like a series recommendation that is similar to Let's Play or has similar vibes and is complete, then check out Concubine Walkthrough. Modern day Korean girly mysteriously finds herself unable to log out in a virtual reality MMORG historical Chinese dynasty of some sort where she is the villainous and will die by the emperor's hand if she doesn't become his empress before the main character is crowned. This series is so great that to this day, I cannot stop raving about it. It's got court intrigue, unlikely friendships, gamer nerd elements, murder, handsome love interests, independent female lead, crazy plot twists, fantastic character designs, and a happy ending, no matter how impossible it seems. It's basically Sword Art Online meets Historical Palace K slash C drama meets Isakade Manwa, I'm the villainous trope. It's great. Read it, y'all. You will not regret it. And this concludes my ultimate Let's Play review. Now be mindful, the series is not complete, so when it is complete, I will upload my opinion on the ending and see if I feel any differently from my opinions in this video. Thank you everyone for sticking around. It brings me utter joy to entertain you for the last some odd minutes. Also, thank you for putting up with my voice. I know it's been kind of weird sounding because I am recovering from a sickness, so. I appreciate that. Subscribe if you are feeling my content or watch another video even. Feel free to follow my socials or even visit my website daydaydoes.com where I have my comics, fan fictions, and new blurbs published. So if you want to catch the latest Day Day Does something news, holla at me over there. That's it for now. Until next time, everyone. Cheers.